Um, economic development. Uh, we mentioned yesterday that only about 4%, or actually CBG grantees only spend about 4% of their entitlement funds on economic development activities. And that's probably for a variety of reasons, but um, a lot of the stigma around CBG funded economic development is that documentation is, is cumbersome, it's a little more nuanced, it's a little hard. Um, some of those things are true, some of them are not true. And so my goal for you for this module, this training is to eliminate some of the stigma, but also just give an overview understanding of how you can use CDBG for economic development activities, okay? There is a resource on your USB file called the Economic Development Toolkit. It's about 150 pages or so of how to use CDBG for economic development. There's a whole course designed around that manual, that guidebook, that's about a day and a half or two days long. And so we're gonna condense that information into an hour long module, okay? So please bear with me, okay? Bear with me. You're gonna hear some new terms. Some of this is gonna go pretty fast and I'm trying to break it down into chunks. Uh, we're also gonna be discussing 108 in this module. That's in and of itself a whole training as well. And so we have a lot of information condensed into an hour. Um, so don't feel like you have to walk away as an expert in economic development but just trying to understand what you can do with it as well as some of the new terms and what they mean, okay? That's the goal for this module, okay? And I'm available after if you guys have questions, okay? All right, so one of the resources that we provide you in your packet or it was out on the table was a flow chart. Everyone pick that up? That just kind of walks you through the basic process of economic development activities under CDBG, okay? That'll kind of give you a process orientation of what goes on as well as introducing at what point do some of these requirements and thought processes have to be included uh, as you work through your economic development program or strategy, okay? So that is a resource for you as well. That's also in the economic development toolkit I referenced earlier. You don't have to have it out right now, but just so you know that there is that process if it helps orient you to kind of some of the, the, the process flows of, of economic development in CDBG, okay? So, here we go. You guys ready? All right. It's a good thing this is after or before lunch and not after lunch, trust me. Okay. So, here we go. Special economic development activities. Okay? Do me a favor. Underline that. Okay? We're going to start separating these out. Draw a line under special economic development activities. We're going to come back to what that means. Okay? We're going to break all these down in detail, but for right now, I want you to underline community-based development organizations. We talked a little bit about community CBDOs. They are not an activity in essence. They are really a delivery mechanism for economic development activity, and we're going to talk about what that is. Okay, so draw a line under that. We're going to try and separate some of these things. Now, technical assistance to business, micro-enterprise activities, commercial rehab, infrastructure to assist businesses, training. These are all standalone economic development activities. Okay. Now what I want you to do is put a star or asterisk by technical assistance, microenterprise, commercial rehab, infrastructure, and job training. Okay, put a little star by it. Each one of those with the star could also be a special economic development activity. Okay? They could be standalone or they can be a component of a special economic development activity. Okay? It all depends on what you're trying to achieve, how you document it, okay? And we're gonna kind of break down these things, but I wanna kind of separate some of these. So we have special ED, we have CBDOs, which are our delivery mechanisms for economic development activities, and then we have these other ones that standalone matrix codes and IDIS, standalone activities, or could be classified under special economic development, okay? So let's start with special ED. Start off with the reg citation. So for the first bullet here, acquire, construct, rehab, uh, reconstruct or install commercial or industrial buildings or equipment by recipient or subrecipient only, that is 570-203-A. Okay, 570-203-A. 
that can also include matrix codes 17A through 17, I think it's C or D. Okay? So if you want to set up a special economic development activity that involves the acquisition construction, uh, that line there, 570203A, matrix code 17A to I think C or D. Okay? Assistance to for profit businesses. That's, that's 57203B and matrix code 18A. Okay? So sorry, can you repeat the first one one more time? The first one up here? Uh, that's 57203A, matrix codes 17A to 17C or D. The second one is 203B, matrix code 18A. 18A. 18A, 18A. The third bullet here, economic development services in connection with special economic development activities. That's 203C, 570, 203C in the regulations, and matrix code 18B. Okay? I'm giving you that now so that you have references to go back to the regs when, we, when, when you guys leave here and go back to your offices that you have that, that, that citation. Okay, so let's break each one of these down. So special ED refers to these three types of activities, okay? So if we think of these as separate types of activities within special economic development. So what types of things can you do under the first one here? Acquire, construct, uh, or reconstruct or install commercial buildings or equipment by the recipient or recipient only. What types of things do you think you can accomplish under that? You can do things like business incubators, okay? You can do uh, railroad spurs, where you're trying to drive rail to, uh, uh, to, a, to a business or something like that, okay? Those types of things are eligible under that first one. Assistance to for-profit businesses is essentially a broad category of you providing CVG dollars to assist a for-profit business. So working capital, loans, inventory, technical assistance, all things that you can accomplish under that activity. So if you wanted to assist, for instance, a factory to expand their business, for-profit company, you can provide uh, loans, grants, working capital loans, all those things to assist that for-profit business to expand. Okay, that's just one type of thing you can accomplish under that. Question? Yes. The ownership yeah. of the land. Um, so for the acquisition between the owner at the end of the day being the private developer or could a local jurisdiction be So this is, this is what that's referring to here, is that this is carried out by the recipient or sub-recipient only. So you the public entity, or a nonprofit okay. entity. Yes. So if it's, uh, let's say, a pizza company that's looking to expand and they need more pizza ovens and more of that stuff, you can provide them a working capital loan to purchase that. That's one of another exceptions, yes. Yes. Okay, so economic development services in connection with special economic activities. So let's say you're providing um, a, let me see here. My neighboring city has a new plan. Okay, yeah. your neighboring city. <laughs> Good, go ahead. They want to uh, fund an art gallery to expand. Uh, they currently have a distribution warehouse, but they want to add a physical gallery. Mm -hmm. The total cost of the project is, let's say, I think my neighbor is at $280,000. And they're looking for CDBG funding of about $100,000 to assist with that project. Mm -hmm. And in exchange, they will provide five LMI jobs. Sounds, sounds like it's eligible. Yeah. yeah, sounds like it's eligible. So for instance, under, under this one, you may have, you may be working with like a CDFI that's going to underwrite the economic development transaction, right? And so that can be provided as a service in connection with carrying out that activity where you have the CDFI making, working with the, the for-profit businesses to, to market their product, underwrite their deals, their transactions, 
that could be a service in support of an economic development activity. So that's just one example. But job training is one, um, marketing, outreach, screening of clients or screening of potential businesses is another. Um, so again, it's these two activities up here, and then this is in support of those two activities. Okay. So special economic development activity has flexibility in the types of assistance you provide to those businesses. You design how you want to provide that assistance. You determine that. Okay. So you can do a grant, you can do a loan, you can do a guarantee, or you may just provide them expertise. For instance, it's a microenterprise or a small business trying to start up and they don't have um, an accounting system and you can provide them technical assistance to, to start their accounting system, make sure all the protocols and everything are included, um, or other support type services, okay? A special economic development activity may meet several national objectives. It really depends on the business you're assisting and the location. But here's my guidance to you. You want to choose the national objective that provides the least barriers to you in terms of documentation. Okay? You have several to choose from depending on the business and location that you're assisting, um, but there you have options. And so choose the option that provides the least barriers to you. But here's what I'll say. And this is where a lot of the stigma comes with economic development activities under CDBG. People always say, oh, the jobs documentation requirement is so onerous. Maybe. Um, I think so many grantees are used to housing projects, public facilities, public services. It's just ingrained. You have the processes, you have the protocols already down pat to do those activities. Economic development, not a lot of grantees use CDBG dollars for that, so therefore a lot of the protocols and requirements are a little, a little more nuanced and a little new. Um, but if you look at the stats, most projects funded under special economic development choose the low mod jobs national objective. Okay? It's a high percentage of them that do. Okay? So there's rationale for that, obviously. If you're going to put the effort out to assist a business that's going to say, hey, we're going to provide low mod jobs, you want to get credit for creating those low mod jobs. Okay? So it sounds a lot better than area of benefit or, 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 or other national objectives that may be applicable, okay? So just consider that. So here's where some new terminology starts to come in. If you're doing a special economic development activity, you will trigger two things. Something called the public benefit test. We're gonna define that later. And the voluntary underwriting requirements associated with that, also known as Appendix A. Voluntary underwriting guidelines. Okay, these are standards developed by HUD to help underwrite special economic development projects. They're voluntary, but they're reasonable. Okay, so just like you would underwrite a housing project, you would look at the performer, you're looking at the return on all, all that stuff. HUD has put out guidelines to underwrite economic development projects. They're very similar to how you would approach underwriting a housing project. So they're not onerous, they're what you should do. Okay? But HUD basically says if you adopt these guidelines and you underwrite it in accordance with that and document that, that satisfies that portion of the test. Okay? So public benefit tests, which we're going to define and voluntary underlying guidelines apply only to special economic development activities. Not the, the other things on that list on the first slide, okay? Just special ED activities. So if you have a project or, or an activity that you want to fund that could, you know, be eligible as a special ED activity and could be eligible as a non-special ED activity, if you categorize that as a special ED, you're going to trigger public benefit and you're going to trigger the voluntary underwriting requirements. Okay? So just be aware of that. Yes? If it's the grantee, like, let's say, for instance, the student who's in the state mm -hmm. um, and so it's not going out as a grant or a loan, really, you know, they're using it. Should you still underwrite or adopt those underwriting practices? Yes. Even if it's to yourself, essentially, you need to write it up like you're granting the money to You still need to document that it meets those standards. Yes. Okay. Yep. So, Yeah. Right. Okay. 
That's special economic development. We're gonna come back to the public benefit test and the voluntary underwriting requirements, but that's a lot of things you can do under there, okay? You can build hotels, you can do incubators, you can do all sorts of types of things, shopping centers, all types of things under special ED. And when we talk about 108, we'll talk about a better way to fund those things too. Yeah. Okay. So then uh, I mean, it again depends on how you want to categorize that. It seems like that can that can be categorized several different ways. So I mean, it seems eligible, but how you categorize that activity that they're doing, whether it's commercial facade improvements, other things, there's several ways to to, to qualify that. Okay. Okay. Community-based development organizations. So we talked about this on day one. Um, we're going to kind of touch on a little bit more detail here. And so I said on the first slide that they're not really an activity of themselves. They're really a delivery mechanism for economic development activities. And I think I mentioned on day one that CBDOs carry out three basic activities, okay? They carry out community economic development projects, neighborhood revitalization, or energy conservation, okay? If they meet the CDBO criteria and they're carrying out these three types of activities, they are a CBDO, and you can fund them under a CBDO activity, okay? But it has to be categorized as a, one of these three things. If it's something that falls outside of this, then that is not a CBDO activity. It still may be eligible CDBG activity. It just can't be carried out under this designation, okay? Who certifies on CBDOs? You, the grantee. Yep. And so there's board criteria. It's kind of similar to the CHODO, but I think one of the aspects is like 51% instead of one third or something like that. Yeah, there's a different requirement for the board. Okay. So what types of things can CBDOs do? Um, so they do one of those three things. They can also do job training through a CBDO, okay? If you do job training or provide job training through a CBDO, it doesn't count against the public service cap, okay? But because that's, that job training is intended to be linked to an economic development activity, that job training is to help people who are gonna take the jobs that are created by the economic development activity. So it's not like you're providing service to the community. You're providing job training for specific individuals that are gonna take those jobs. So I think Rudy mentioned the, the forklift expertise. You're training them to have that expertise to take the job that's going to be created by the activity that you're assisting. Okay? CBDO economic development activities do trigger public benefit tests. Okay? So if they're carrying out an economic development activity, that's a special ED activity, even if it's carried out by the CBDO, that does trigger public benefit standards. And again, we're going to define that later. Okay? That's CBDOs. I'm going to keep this moving. Technical assistance to businesses. This is a broad category under CDBG. Okay? It's a broad category. It can be interpreted several different ways. Okay? But in general, the TA is designed to help reduce the risk of business failure. So things like accounting, making sure their accounting requirements and systems are up to speed. Um, how to do their HR, you know, procedures and those kind of things, making sure all that's in place, okay? Um, providing them financial guidance, how they should spend their, their, their capital, their working capital to, to create that business or sustain that business, those kind of things, okay? It can focus on business planning or legal or accounting issues, often offered in conjunction with other financial assistance. So we might not just give you the working capital loan, we're also gonna give you financial guidance on how to spend that what types of products you should buy, what's the best purchasing approach, all those things, okay? This is critical to programs directed at startups, okay? So if you have a new business, a small business venture that's, that's coming up, obviously you wanna invest in them and make sure that they have the, the right guidance as they grow their business. Most businesses fail in, in, in the first several months to a year of operation, so this is really getting them over that hump, okay? So that's the way TA is designed to assist Businesses. Okay. Under CDBG, you can categorize this several ways. OK. 
Okay. You can categorize it as part of a special economic development activity. If you do that, however, you trigger the public benefit. Okay. You can provide technical assistance uh, under a microenterprise task. Okay. So if you're providing assistance directly to a microenterprise, you can provide that as TA under CDBG. You can also do it as a public service and through a CBDO. Okay. Through a CBDO though, again, on the previous slide we said it must meet the public benefit standard because that CD, CBDO activity is a special ED activity. Okay. As a public service, there's a public service matrix code called um, uh, employment training, those kind of things. That can be recognized as technical assistance to, to a business. Okay. So there's a variety of ways that you can, you can couch TA. Um, but just know that if it's framed in the, in the way of a special economic development, it's going to trigger the public benefit test. Microenterprises. You can use CBG dollars to fund microenterprises. CDBG has a specific definition of microenterprises, which differs from the SBA definition of microenterprise. So the CDBG definition is that it's a commercial enterprise with less than or equal to five employees. Okay. And that microenterprise could be defined as an owner or person who worked toward developing, or they have an existing business that they're looking to expand. Okay. So you can assist that microenterprise as a loan, a grant, other forms of financial support, and other support activities. So it doesn't have to be money that you're providing. Okay? You can provide other support activities. So things like technical assistance, advice, business services to the owners or, or persons developing the microenterprise. Then they have this thing called general support to the owner. What does that mean? What does general support mean? So the way to think about this is microenterprise, um, likely a low-income owner trying to start a business, there's barriers to them being able to start that business. Barriers, I think we, we all probably, challenges we all have, right? How do I get affordable childcare to watch my kids that allows me to start my business, okay? Think about it in terms of like that. I might live on a far part of town where there's no uh, public transit. How, do, how can I pro provide transportation or pay for transportation costs to allow that owner to get to and from their business to allow them to sustain their business, okay? So think about those kind of things when you think about general support, okay? What allows them to continue operating their business and expanding their business and growing, okay? Um, this general support is not subject to the public service cap because it's classified as a microenterprise activity, which it has its own matrix code under, uh, under um, CDBG, which is 18C. Okay, it's in the 18 series, economic development activity, not the 05 public service series. Okay, has its own thing. Um, so if you're providing general support, that can be classified as a enterprise activity. Okay. It can also include training and TA to build a recipient or sub-recipient capacity that might be administering the microenterprise loan program. For instance, the CDFI that's providing loans, working capital loans to the microenterprise. You can uh, provide TA and training to, to build that recipient capacity. Okay. Um, there's no limit on the amount or CDBG loan or grant to each microenterprise. You need to determine that. You can work with your CDFIs, your other lenders to determine how do we want to structure this lending program? Do we want to cap it at $5,000, $15,000, $20,000? There's no CDBG regulations on that, but obviously you need to use your best judgment. Okay? Because again, a lot of businesses fail at startup. And so if you put all the money out there, a lot of money into investing in their working capital or something like that, you may not get that money back. Okay? So you just need to be careful how you structure that program. Microenterprise assistance is not subject to the public benefit test if it's a separate program. Remember, I've asked you to put a star by microenterprise and all those other ones because it could be a special ED activity. If you set it up in your comp plan where you say, hey, this is not a, intended to assist 
under a special ED activity. This is to, to assist general microenterprises that we're going to provide working capital loans to, all those things, and it's separate from that. You can, you can set it up and it's not subject to the public benefit test. Okay, so you just need to clarify in your comp plan that this is a separate non-special ED program that we're going to be running. Okay, so you just want to make sure you clarify that in your comp plan. In a microenterprise, the owner is not required to be an LMI, but you still need to meet a national objective. So if the owner was LMI in a microenterprise scenario, what national objective could you qualify under? Starts with a C. Limited clientele. Okay, low mod clientele. Okay. So if the owner was low mod, you can qualify this under the low, limited uh, low mod clientele national objective. Okay. Question. Yes. We're going to talk about revolving loan funds tomorrow or tomorrow or later today. I think it's tomorrow when we get to financial management. Okay, but, but hold that question because it's a good question to have. Okay. okay, so now we're on to commercial rehab. How many of you have a commercial economic development program, commercial rehab program in your, in your jurisdiction? Okay, only a few of you. Okay. So rehab of commercial or industrial properties is eligible under 570-202-A3. The special ED series was 203. So this is an activity that can sit outside of that, or it could be a special ED activity. Okay, so let's talk about that. If it's a private for-profit owner, okay, you're assisting a, a private for-profit owner, the rehabilitation is limited to the exterior of the building. Okay, and correction of any code violations. So there's two restrictions there, exterior and any code violations associated with that, if it's a for-profit private owner. Okay. Other improvements, so we're still talking about the for-profit owner, anything that falls outside of the exterior or the code violations must be carried out under the special economic development category 203. And that would be basically assistance to a for-profit business. Okay. So we can classify it as its own commercial rehab project, which sits outside of special economic development, okay, as its own matrix code, if you limit it to just the first item here. If the scope goes beyond that, okay, you've got to go beyond the code violations or the exterior of the building uh, facade type improvements, then you have to classify it as a special ED activity. If it remains under this, you meet this criteria and that's all you're doing, it's not subject to the bubble benefit test because it's set up as its own commercial rehab activity. Okay. Job training, again, another broad category of eligible activity under CDBG. The idea is that you're providing training to help um, under unemployed or underemployed persons gain skills to meet the labor market. Okay. Under economic development, as an economic development activity, okay, as an economic development activity, this is linked to job placement. You're training them to take a specific job. Going back to the forklift operator, okay? You're training them to take a specific job. This is not general employment training that you see under public services, which is 05 series, right? Still its own eligible activity, um, but not an economic development activity because it's not linked to jobs, okay? So it's eligible as a public service, as I just mentioned, as part of special economic development, as part of a microenterprise activity if you're assisting the employees of that microenterprise, okay? You guys with me? So what can't you do? Job pirating is very rarely proved under CDBG. Um, so it's not uh, a huge issue, but just so that you're aware, job pirating is prohibited. So if you assist in the relocation of a plant or facility and the relocation will result in significant job loss in another geographic area in the U.S., that is prohibited. Okay, and then they tell you what the significant loss can be defined as. Okay. 
I think we touched on this, this yesterday a bit as well. Okay. So we went through the national objectives associated with uh, economic development activities on day one. Uh, so just to recap, economic development projects typically fall under low mod job creation. That's typically what you're trying to achieve is the creation or retention of jobs. Okay. So to do that, you want to make sure you're documenting how will jobs be created or jobs will be lost without that assistance, so retained. Okay, you need to have documentation on that in the file. And how those jobs will be made available to or held by low to moderate income uh, persons. Okay, so there is a documentation requirement associated with that. Here's the key thing, though. You need to track jobs for a reasonable period of time. Reasonable period of time is not defined in the regulations, so it's determined as long as jobs are still being created. So let me give you an example. If you assisted a for-profit business and, they, and your agreement with them was that as receiving part of the CBG dollars, they're going to create 50 jobs. Okay? Let's say within two years, they actually created 75 jobs. Do you stop counting when they hit that 50? You say, you've fulfilled your requirements, you've got our 50 jobs, see you later? No, because as a result of your assistance, they actually overachieved. Okay, so here's another important point about the job creation national objective. There's something called the presumption, which I think Rudy touched on as well yesterday. You want to always try and meet the presumption. Okay, it lessens the requirements for documentation. Okay, so you always want to try and meet the presumption. So you may presume a person is low mod if it meets these criteria, okay? And this is an or. So they live in a census tract with 70% LMI or live in a census tract with an enterprise zone or an enterprise community. I don't think, does anyone know if they're an enterprise zone or enterprise community? Several of you? Okay. Yeah, there's only about 30 in the country, so we've <laughs> got several here. Um, they live in a census tract area with poverty rate of 20% and no uh, central business district and evidences of progressive poverty and general distress, so you need to be able to document that. Okay, similar to kind of how you determine deteriorated area for slum and blight, you need to be able to document that there's evidences of pervasive poverty and general distress. Or business job located in an in a ECEZ or area of poverty rate 20%. So it's basically just laying on additional requirements, okay? So if you can meet the presumption, um, you can presume that that person is low mod. So again, it just lessens the documentation requirements. Now all you have to say is where does that person live? We can document that where their address meets these requirements. Presume that they're low mod, okay? Other national objectives will be eligible as well. Um, you can qualify under, um, from microenterprise, we talked about if the owner themselves was low mod, they can, they can, you can qualify that under the, the limited clientele national objective. Uh, certain job training, if you're training low mod individuals, could qualify under limited clientele. And if it's a service type business, you assisted a grocery store, you can qualify that as area benefit because obviously that grocery store is going to serve an area, not just specific people. Some economic development activities may meet slum blight area national objective. So again, you just want to be able to make sure you're documenting that, um, you know, as Rudy talked about yesterday. <coughs> Some activities may qualify under either a job creation or retention or low mod area national objective if um, it's carried out by a CDFI in a primarily residential area. You have, if you're assisting, if you're working with the CDFI, um, there's certain flexibilities that are granted to a CDFI that aren't granted to other organizations. And so basically what they're saying is that um, you can meet the area benefit if you're working with CDFI in, their, in primarily a primarily residential area with 51% low mod. Okay, so that's another way you can meet uh, the area benefit is if you're working with CDFI, they have that flexibility. Okay. Or if it's part of an NRS, HUD NRSA strategy area. I think several of you from yesterday have NRSAs, approved NRSAs. So if you're, have it, if you're working in an NRSA area, you also can qualify your economic development activity under uh, the low mod area benefit. 
you have to decide uh, what national objective is going to be met at record decisions within IDIS. Okay, so when you're setting up the activity, you need to know right then what national objective I'm going under. Because as I think Rudy mentioned yesterday, you're going to get screens based on that selection. And if you start documenting things that don't apply to that, you're not going to be able to substantiate or it's going to be harder to substantiate your national objective compliance because you've gone down the wrong path of documentation. Okay, so very important to know that at the start. Not something you want to determine afterwards. Okay. Okay. So we've gone through the economic development activities under CDBG. Talked about special economic development, CBDOs, microenterprises, job training, technical assistance. Um, now we're circling back to special economic development. Okay. Here's where we're going to talk about the public benefit standards and guidelines. Okay. So I mentioned earlier that for special economic development projects, there's two parts, the voluntary under guidelines and, and public benefit standards. You need to be able to document these determinations in writing. Okay. And when we go through what these standards are, you, it'll be clear why. Okay. You need to be able to document this. Like most every other thing in CDBG and HUD world, compliance, compliance, compliance is backed up by documentation, documentation, documentation. Okay. So let's look at the underwriting guidelines first. Okay, let's unpack these first. And again, you might hear this referred to as Appendix A is because the underwriting guidelines were captured in Appendix A uh, of the reg. So, grantees should ensure that project costs are reasonable. Simple requirement, right? You want to make sure that the project costs are reasonable. You would do this in any normal business transaction, specifically on the housing development side. You want to make sure that the project costs are reasonable. So you need to be able to document that. I also want to document that all sources of financing are committed. Why do you think that's important? Do you want to be the first person they come to with their big idea of this new hotel in downtown? They can come to you first, but they got to be able to show that, hey, this $20 million project that's going to take $1 million of our CDBG dollars, that other $19 million is accounted for. Okay? You don't want to just say, hey, yeah, here's our $1 million. Go use that to leverage and collect your other 19. Okay, you want to make sure that all the sources of financing are committed. So you need to have documentation from those lenders, um, so the, from those investors, that they're committed to this project. Okay, so you need to be able to document that. And you do this in your, in your underwriting. Okay. You want to also document that CDBG is not substituted for the non federal resources. Okay, so if they've already said, hey, I've got money from philanthropic, right? You don't say, oh, well, here, our CDBG dollars, give that philanthropic money back, okay? You want to make sure that, hey, if you've got philanthropic resources covering that, great. We can cover something else, okay? So you're not substituting uh, one source for another with your CDBG, okay? You want to make sure the project is financially viable. So you want to make sure that, just like you would underwriting a housing development project, the return on investment, the capital, everything is there. Okay, they have the ability to repay your loan if it's a loan. Uh, their other resources are going to get repaid. Their other lending requirements are going to get repaid. You want to make sure that it's a feasible project. Okay, makes sense, right? You want to make sure that there's the return on investment is reasonable, similar to, to you know a, a project that would be um, assisting a developer, right? You want to make sure that their return is reasonable. Okay, you don't want everyone getting rich off this project because of your CDBG investment. Okay, you want to make sure that, and this is probably a really, really important one, CDBG funds are distributed pro rata. So in essence, what that is saying is that if you said, here's a million dollars for your project, you've got 19 million in other resources, that's great. Don't come to us asking for the million dollars from us first. Okay, you want to get 50,000 from this person, 50,000 from that person, so that you're not putting all in your CDBG dollars at the first draw that they have, and then the rest of the project goes down. Okay, so it should be pro rata in accordance with the other resources in the project. Okay, so you just want to look at those things. And you want to be able to document that you've followed these guidelines, and you have documentation that supports that this project is consistent with these guidelines. Okay. So not, not too onerous, right? This is something you should do 
in the normal course of business. Okay? So that's voluntary underwriting guidelines. <coughs> so now let's talk about public benefit. First thing I'll say is the underwriting guidelines were voluntary, right? These are HUD's suggestions of what you should follow. Um, my suggestion to you is that you adopt those guidelines and you follow those guidelines. And obviously they're detailed a little bit more in the regs than what I just went through, but those are voluntary for all intents and purposes, they're voluntary. The public benefit standards are mandatory. Okay, you have to follow these if you're doing special economic development activities. Okay, guideline, underwrite guidelines, voluntary, public benefits, mandatory. So as I covered earlier, these, guy, these, the, these standards are mandatory for the following type of activities, special economic development, CBDO projects that are, in essence, carrying out or delivering special economic development activities, and any public improvements that basically support a special economic development activity. Okay? So the public benefit standard is not applicable to a microenterprise activity or commercial rehab because then those are set up as their own activities. They could be special ED activities, but it doesn't automatically apply to it if they're categorized outside of the special economic development activity. Okay, so it doesn't apply to them. So let's look at what are these public benefit standards. So you have two options for determining the public benefit. Okay. You can determine, you want to calculate the jobs created or retained, okay? Or you can say, we're going to look at the goods or services provided to low mod in income persons. We're going to base our public, meeting the public benefit standard by looking at goods and services provided. We're going to unpack this a little more, okay? There's two tests. There's the individual test and then there's the aggregate test. Okay, we're going to unpack these as well. Projects must meet the individual tests. So every economic special ED activity or project that you fund has to meet the individual test. Okay. Your entire economic development program, your entire special ED uh, program, all the activities round up that you do under special ED for the program must meet the aggregate test. Okay. We're going to unpack those. Okay. So here's the individual standard. Okay, here's the individual test that you have to meet. CDBG assistance may not exceed 50,000 per full-time equivalent permanent job created or retained. Okay, let me give you an example. If you provide a $100,000 loan uh, and that person said we're gonna create two jobs based on that loan, does that meet this test? Yes, okay. If you provided $3,000 in CDBG dollars and let's say TA services to, to, to a business, and they said we're gonna serve, um, we're gonna provide services as a result of that TA to three people. Does that meet this test? Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Okay. You provided $3,000, they serve three people, meets the test, okay? That's in essence what this is, is documenting, okay? That your CBG dollars doesn't exceed a certain amount per full-time equivalent or person served. So remember I said you have to determine how you're gonna calculate this up front. So you need to determine whether you're gonna apply it to jobs or the goods and services test. Okay, and a lot of this will depend on what type of business you're assisting. Okay. So how do you apply this? <coughs> Again, the individual standard applies to all activities obligated in any given CDBG program year. So each special ED project that you, that you set up has to meet the individual standard test throughout that program year, okay? Again, you determine whether you're gonna use the job creation or retention or the low mod income goods and services test, okay? So it's either one per 50 or uh, um, one per thousand in goods and services, okay? When you're providing a job training activity, okay? And again, job training activities, under special economic development must do what? Must be linked to what? To the jobs that are being created, right? It's not just training in general, it's training for the specific jobs that are created, right? Okay. Okay, that's the individual standard. Pretty straightforward. Every, every special economic development project 
has to meet that test. Here's the aggregate standard, okay? This says that you must, you see, use of CDBG dollars must create or retain at least one full-time equivalent, one FTE, permanent job per 35,000. So the aggregate applies to the program, all the special economic development activities that you've done throughout the program year. Not each individual project, all those activities rolled up into one program must meet this aggregate standard test to that. Okay. So again, similar to the individual standard, you look at all the activities obligated in a given program year and ensure that they meet the, the aggregate standard. And again, you're looking at either jobs created or retained or goods and services provided. Um, and again, you're using the jobs created if you're assisting a job training only activity. Okay. That's in essence is the public benefit standard. And it applies to only special ED activities. Okay. Any question on that before we get into 108? Okay. How many of you have a active Section 108 loan? Okay, good. Good. How many of you are maxed out your 108 borrowing capacity? Um, so for those of you not familiar with Section 108, Section 108 is a special authorization on the CDBG that allows you, the grantee, to borrow up to five times your annual CDBG allocation at one time. Borrow all five years' worth. You can borrow one year's worth, two years' worth, three years' worth. But allows you access to that money, five years' worth, at one time. Okay. In one lump sum, you can say, I want to access five times. So if you get $5 million in CDBG, you can borrow in Section 108 authority up to $25 million. Now, the common question is, does that then reduce my CDBG allocation for that year? The answer is no. You get your five times plus your CDBG allocation that you get for that year. Okay? Everyone's like, oh, wow, why isn't everyone doing this, right? Um, So it's called Section 108 Loan Guarantee Program for a reason. You borrowing this money, HUD is guaranteeing that the investors are going to get their money back. Where do you think they're going to get the money to pay the investors back? CDBG. Your CDBG allocation. Okay. So if you borrow, you max out your 108 authority, you borrow the full amount, and you have a portfolio of 10 loans that you assisted, Five of them aren't performing. I'm going to take that annual payment out of your CDBG allocation. So it might be a $500,000 payment. It might be a $400,000 payment. How's it going to take that? Now, you have other resources you can pledge instead of your CDBG, right? You might have a local housing trust or a local, some other local revenue that you can say, hey, don't take our CDBG. We have this other resource that's going to pay you back. Okay, so there's ways to negotiate that. But in essence, HUD has never defaulted on a Section 108 loan. Because they take your CDBG. Absolutely. Yes. What happens if you're not funded next year? That's right. That's right. Great, great question. And appropriate in given these times, right? Yes. Yeah, so you would have to have a, some other collateral or resources to pay it back. Okay? Just because CDBG goes away or if CDBG goes away doesn't mean you're off the hook for repaying that money. Because again, these are investors. These are investors. So yeah, it goes to your general funds, whatever other resources you have. We're going to get into that, but yes, in essence. In essence, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Typically, that's what you do. You, you use program income to repay it. Okay, so the lending that you do generates program income, and they use that to pay it back. But if they default, there's no program income to pay it back. Okay? So we're going to unpack this, but it's a great tool if you need to carry out specifically larger uh, catalytic economic development projects. For instance, if you wanted to bring a hotel, a Marriott or, or Hilton downtown, you could use Section 108 to do that. Okay? If you wanted to grow, uh, create a shopping center, you could use 108 to do something like that. I would not recommend you use 108 for a lot smaller transactions. 
Okay, it's a little more complicated. You should use your regular CBG dollars for that. Okay, but if, you, if you've got a great project that just really needs that level of investment from your CBG resources, consider uh, accessing your 108 authorization to do that. Okay, so we're going to unpack 108 in a lot more detail. We're going we're gonna to get into that. Yeah. So oh, here's a basic outline of the process, right? You apply to HUD for, for the 108 authorization, and there's a whole application process you have to go through, but you essentially apply to HUD for that authorization. You pledge your future CDBG dollars as collateral for, for the, the, the authorization. HUD generates that, that money through uh, private investors, provides you, in essence, the, the access to the 108 loan, and then you repay that note using rent and renew generated by the project. Okay, pretty simple, pretty streamlined. If you look in your toolkit, it goes into a lot more, the ED toolkit that I talked about on your USB file, it goes into a lot more detail about this process. In essence of time, I'm not gonna cover all the ins and outs of that, but it, it is a process, like everything else, right? It is a process, okay? There's some advantages of 108 and why this is a, such a useful tool, okay? One, it leverages limited grant funds, because remember, you get your annual allocation and whatever you're asking for in 108. They don't reduce your annual allocation to give you 108. Okay, so you get both, okay? So it's a way to leverage those resources. You can still use your CBG resources as you would normally would, and you can now use your one-way for a specific project or specific projects, okay? It is not a general obligation of debt. This is very important for city financial managers where they're like, oh, I gotta, this is more debt on the city, our bond rating's gonna go down, all that. No, it's not a general obligation of debt, so it doesn't impact that rating, okay? It doesn't impact your, your, your debt. Um, because it's guaranteed by your CDBG allocation, okay? You can access, access the funds immediately. So if you say, I want all five years worth right now, you get all five years worth. I'm simplifying it, but HUD has to approve your application, but you can ask for it, you get it at one time, okay? So you can access that funding immediately. You have the ability to restructure payment based on specific projects. So as projects come in, you vet them, you evaluate them, you underwrite them, you say, hey, I got access to my 25 million, but for this project, I only need access to, the 25, to 5 million. So you submit that project, it gets approved, you get the 5 million, you fund that project, okay? So it's not, just because you have access to the 25 doesn't mean you now owe HUD all 25 million. It's only what you draw down through eligible projects through those, that funding source. Okay. 108 is long-term fixed rate financing at favorable rates. And favorable rates is determined as triple A rated paper. Okay. Very hard to access triple rated paper. These terms are going to be very favorable to a developer. The construction loan they get from the bank is not going to come at these rates. Okay. So when they compare that, they're like, oh wow. I might want to access this funding, okay? They're probably going to want to understand what it is, but it'll be favorable to them, okay? So we talked about it being up to five times your annual allocation. The term for the Section 108 loan can be up to 20 years. So the longer the term, the lower the cost, right? So if you spread out the financing over 20 years, that lowers the cost to the developer. So a lot of times your construction loans from banks and other things aren't going to give you 20 year terms. Okay, so section 108 can be up to 20 years. You don't have to go up to 20 years, but you can stretch it out over 20 years. This allows your projects to be feasible because that, that, that lowers their repayment. Okay, so this is all making sense, right? The rates, I'm not going to go into detail about the rates, but there's basically two types of financing. There's permanent financing, and there's interim financing. Okay, we're going to unpack these a little bit, but just, just rest with that for right now. Okay. There are fees, like most transactions with the bank, there are fees associated with 108. There's actually a new rule that came out um, that says that HUD has to charge you the grantee fees associated with borrowing the 108, because there's a cost to that. You can pass that cost on to your third-party borrowers. Okay, you can make it a part of their financing, is that there's this fee that has to be paid. Okay, and there's a, a notice that came out 
on November 3rd, 2015, that describes that fee and that process. So you can look up that notice, okay? Actually, I think it's on your USB file, so you don't have to look it up, okay? Um, so what types of things can you do? A lot of these things you can do with Section 108, again, more commonly, you're looking at these catalytic projects, these larger investments that you couldn't otherwise fund um, to revitalize downtown, bring a hotel, bring housing, okay? You can remediate brownfields and then build housing or construct facilities on that. So a whole host of things that you can do. What don't you see on this list? When you think about eligible CDBG, specifically economic development activities, what, what don't you see on here that you could do otherwise with CDBG? Public services? Microenterprise? Okay. Can't fund those using your Section 108 dollars. No public services, no microenterprises. Okay. So just like your normal CBG allocation, there's rules associated with 108. There needs to be an eligible activity. You have to meet a national objective. The 70% LMI, everybody went over that, that requirement, still has to apply as well as all the other cross-cutting federal requirements associated with CDBG, okay? So in essence, it's CDBG dollars, okay? All these things still apply. <coughs> so in terms of just kind of orienting you to the flow of the process for Section 108 financing, okay? So this is you, the applicant, borrowing the money, okay? So if we start here at number one, you advance the request to HUD saying, hey, we want to borrow Section 108. HUD says, okay, that's great. We're going to go to our lenders and investors to raise the capital to fund your 108 request. Okay. The lender or the investors advance the money to you, the borrower, and then you repay them okay, through, those, through the 108 uh, proceeds generated through those projects. Okay. That's, in essence, the process. And again, I'm simplifying it, but that, that is, in essence, the process. Pretty straightforward. If you, the grantee, say, you know what? We have this developer over here that wants to borrow, wants access to the 108. We're going to ask for the authorization. We're going to get the money from the investor, but we're going to relend that to this developer. Okay? That adds this component into the process. So again, you make the request to HUD. HUD talks to the lender, they raise the money, the lender advances the money to you. You then loan that money to a third party. That third party, that developer, repays you, the borrower, okay? This is through the course of the terms of the agreement. So if it's a 20-year term, they're repaying you. Year one has a payment, year two has a payment, year three, and they're repaying you that money. You then, then repay that money to the investors, okay? Everyone's happy, everyone got paid, project's been completed. It's great, right? That's, that's, in essence, the process, okay? So, how do we get access to this money, okay? HUD has what they call a public offering, okay? Usually once, once every 12 months, maybe once every 18 months, okay? They do a public offering where they make an offer to the investors to raise the 108 capital, okay? The 108 proceeds, okay? window for that public offering that's held once every 12 months, HUD provides an interim credit facility that allows you to access the funds, okay? So you don't have to wait till that cycle comes back. You can go and say, hey, I missed the, 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 the 12 month. I want to go in. It gives you access to that interim credit facility, okay? So the physical agent at HUD arranges that interim loan, and there's rates associated with that loan, okay? LIBOR? Yeah, it's a, it's a financial term. It just talks about the rate associated with that. Okay. Public offering provides long term. So that was interim financing. This is permanent financing. Okay. The public offering provides, if you meet that public offering, the next public offering, that's where you can access fixed rate financing. So if you're in the interim, it's a variable rate, as we showed on the next slide. Okay. It's based on the 90-day LIBOR plus 20 basis points. That's, a, that's an interim rate. Okay. It's a variable rate. Permanent loan, if you make that public offering, you can get fixed, eight, fixed rate financing, okay? More favorable financing, lower interest rate financing, more predictable financing, okay? And then like most things, 
there's a fees associated with that, and a loan is serviced by uh, a trustee, okay? So not uncommon to similar transactions that you would have in borrowing money, right? Okay. So what HUD wants you to do, like any other transaction, when we talk about special economic development activity and there's underwriting guidelines, there's risk associated with these transactions, right? So HUD wants to know what are those risks, okay? So they're going to ask you to uh, underwrite these transactions uh, in accordance with uh, specific criteria, okay? So HUD wants you to establish suitable loan terms and conditions designed to mitigate those risks. So again, you're designing and agreeing with the, with the third-party borrower, for instance, what those terms are to mini minimize the risk. Okay, and so this is risk to both your CDBG allocation and your 108 authority, okay? When you make your application to HUD for 108 funding, you have to tell them how you're gonna underwrite 108 transactions, okay? You have to then underwrite those transactions in accordance with that underwriting criteria that you established and HUD agreed to and approved, okay? So part of mitigating the risk is using the underwriting criteria that you established and HUD approved for the project. And so they're going to be looking at, are you mitigating all the risk possible associated with this? Do you have enough collateral? All those things. Okay, so you describe that in your application to HUD. Okay. Currently, the underwriting guidelines filed in Appendix A, which we talked about for special ED activities, are required for all special economic development projects. Okay, you may have additional criteria associated with 108 uh, transactions as well. HUD has prepared guidelines newly prepared guidelines for Section 108 underwriting, okay? That is on your USB file as well, okay? They just came out, they're on your file. Um, that walks you through underwriting a 108 transaction, okay? The Credit Reform Act required communities to pledge collateral in addition to CDBG, so it's not just your CDBG that HUD is looking at to mitigate the risk. Um, there's a uh, collateral in addition to that. So communities must pledge this additional collateral prior to HUD's guarantee of the promissory notes or prior to receiving funds. So HUD wants to know up front what is that collateral. Um, so it's general fund dollars, it's your housing trust resources, whatever that collateral uh, that you identify could be, HUD wants to know what that is up front. Okay, and we talked about the fees already. So. Question, I think the question came up uh, before. What are the sources of repayment for Section 108 funds? Okay, so we talked about the program income generated. So the money generated by the developer for that project um, that's repaid to you is program income. You use that program income to repay the Section 108 debt, okay? Or uh, there's other repayment sources that are negotiated on a case-by-case -case basis. For example, um, you may have a TIF or something like that, tax increment financing district where you, that's generating revenue. You say, hey, we're gonna use that revenue to pay you back, okay? So there's all sorts of ways that you can pay for these things. Um, it doesn't have to be your CDBG dollars or the program income generated by the project. Obviously, if you're assisting a for-profit business and they're generating revenue, that should be the money that pays you back, okay? But you do have options of other resources that you could say, hey, we're gonna pledge these instead. So in addition to knowing where the repayment's gonna come from, uh, forms of additional security for the project is obviously the assets created from the use of the Section 108 could be used as collateral. Um, the portfolio income, uh, your full faith and credit pledge of your CDBG dollars, any debt service reserves or other re revenue streams, uh, parking revenues, other things that are generated locally can be used to.